this morning I'd like to share something with you. Uh, three things. The first one is a story uh, from a medical practitioner. And the second is from God's Word. And the third thing is a little personal experience. So you'll know how close we're getting to lunch. I've told you before. But, uh, you know, when you go to preaching school, the one thing they tell you is that you should never read a story in the pulpit. Uh, you should always tell a story and not read it. So this morning I've got to uh, go against all that wonderful advice because the story I want to share with you is a story that's almost 100 years old. It's a story that's written by a medical doctor and uh, as you know, medical people use medical terms and descriptions and uh, the terminology, etc., is such an integral part of the story that I actually need to, uh, need to read it. So it goes back, keep in mind, the story, as I said, is over 100 years old. It's, uh, it's times are going back when a lot of the medical things that we take for granted today uh, weren't even thought about, weren't, uh, weren't happening at, at that time. It's written in the first person, so when I use I, uh, that is the, the doctor speaking. Two years ago, after I came to California, a fragile young woman expecting her first baby came into my office. I spent time with her trying to build her up psychologically as best as I could and I found her becoming a very wholesome an interesting person as time went on. Partly because of the effort she was making to keep her emotional situation under control and the nearness of the birth of her child. One month before her baby was due, her routine examination showed that the infant was in the breech position. The occasional baby found in this situation in the last month, often turns to the normal head down position by the time it is ready to be born, so that only about one child in 25 is actually born in the breech position. This is fortunate, as the death rate of breech babies is comparatively high because of the difficulty in delivering the after coming head and the need to deliver it quickly after the baby is born. At that moment, the cord becomes compressed between the baby's hard little head and the mother's bony pelvis. When no ox oxygen reaches the baby's bloodstream, it dies within minutes. Everyone in the delivery room is tense in a breech delivery, especially if it is the first baby when the difficulty is greater. The case I'm speaking of was a complete breach. That is, the baby's legs and feet being folded under it in tailor fashion. The hardest thing for the attending doctor to do with any breach delivery is to keep his hands completely away from it until the natural forces of expulsion have thoroughly dilated the firm maternal structures that delay its progress. I waited as patiently as I could, sending frequent messages to the excited family who were waiting in the corridor outside. At last the time had come and I gently drew down one little foot and I grasped for the other, but for some reason it would not come down beside the first one. I pulled again, gently enough, but with a little force and with some light pressure on the abdomen from above by my assisting nurse. And the baby's body moved down just enough for me to see that it was a little girl. And then, to my absolute consternation, I saw that the other foot would never be beside the first one. The entire, entire thigh from the hip 
to the knee was completely missing and that one foot would never reach below the opposite knee. And the baby girl was to suffer this, a curious defect that I have never seen before nor since. And there followed the hardest struggle I have ever had with myself. I knew what a dreadful effect it would have upon the unstable nervous system of the mother. I felt sure that the family would certainly impoverish itself in taking to the child to every specialist that they could possibly find who may offer a ray of hope in their circumstance. But most of all, in these few fleeting moments, I saw this little girl sitting sadly by herself while other girls would laugh and play and run and enjoy their growing up time of life. And then, then I suddenly realised that there was something. There was something that would save every pang of hurt but one. And that one thing was in my power. One breech baby in ten dies in delivery because it is not delivered rapidly enough. And now, if only I did not hurry, if I could just slow my hand, if I could make myself delay those few short moments, and it would not be an easy delivery anyway, no one in all the world would ever know. The mother, after the first shock of grief, would probably be glad that she had lost a child so severely handicapped. In a year or two, she would try again and this tragic fate would never be repeated. Don't bring this suffering upon them, the small voice within me said. This baby has never taken a breath. Don't let her ever take one. And you probably can't get it out in time anyway. Don't hurry. Don't be a fool and bring this terrible thing upon this traumatised little family. Suppose your conscience hurts. Suppose it hurts just a little. You can certainly stand it way better than what they can. I motioned to the nurse for the warm, sterile towel that is always ready for me in a breech delivery to wrap around the baby's body so that the stimulation of the cold air of the outside world may not induce a sudden expansion of the baby's chest, causing the aspiration of fluid that might bring about its death. But this time the towel was only to conceal from the attending nurses that which my eyes alone had seen. With the touch of that pitiful little foot in my hand, a pang of sorrow for the baby's future swept through me and my decision was made. I glanced up and looked at the clock. Three of the allotted seven minutes had already gone. Every eye in the room was now upon me and I could feel the tension in their eagerness to do instantly whatever I asked, totally unaware of what I was feeling. I hoped they could not possibly detect the tension of my own struggle at that moment. These nurses had seen me deliver dozens of breech babies. Successfully, yes, and they had seen me fail too. Now they were going to see me fail again. For the first time in my medical life, I was deliberately discarding that which I had been taught was right for something that I felt sure was better. I slipped my hand beneath the towel to feel the pulsations of the baby's cord, a certain index of its condition. Two to three minutes more would be enough. 
so that I might be seen to be doing something by those watching, I drew the baby down just a little to split out the arms. The usual next step. And as I did so, the little pink foot on the good side bobbed out from its protecting towel and pressed firmly against my slowly moving hand. The hand into whose keeping the safety of the mother and the baby had been entrusted. There was a sudden convulsive movement of the baby's body, an actual feeling of strength and life and vigour. It was all too much. I couldn't do it. I delivered the baby with her pitiful little leg and then had to share that with the family. I had to tell the mother. Every foreboding that I had came true. The frail mother was in hospital for months. I heard of them indirectly from time to time. They'd been to Rochester, Minnesota, Chicago, Boston. Finally, I lost track of them altogether. And as the years went by, I blamed myself bitterly for not having had the strength to yield to my temptation. In our hospital, we have traditionally staged an elaborate Christmas party. Each year, it's put on just for the employees the nurses and the doctors. There's always a beautiful decorated tree over on one side of the, of the stage and weeks are usually spent in the preparation for this event. It is almost like going to an impressive church service as each year we dedicate ourselves anew to the year and the work ahead. This past year the arrangement was somewhat changed the tree over on the left-hand side of the stage had been completely sprayed with silver paint and hung with scores of gleaming silver ornaments without one trace of colour anywhere and without any lights. It shone but faintly in the dim auditorium. Every doctor who could possibly be there was seated in his seat. The first rose were reserved for the nurses and in a moment the procession entered. Each girl upright in her uniform, each one crowned by her nurse's cap. And we rose as one man as they entered to do them honour. And the last one reached her seats. We settled in our places again as the organ began to play an old Christmas carol. And then from the back of the room a giant blue floodlight was turned on and as the light came gradually, it covered the tree with increasing splendour. It became brighter and brighter until every ornament was almost aflame. Over on the other side of the stage, a curtain was slowly drawn back and as it was drawn, we saw three lovely young musicians in shimmering white evening gowns. They played softly in unison with the organ. There was a harp, there was a cello and a violin. And as they played, I was greatly moved. I have always liked the harp and I love to watch the grace of a skillful player. I was especially fascinated by the young harpist who played this instrument extraordinarily well. Her slender fing fingers flickered across the strings and as the nurses sang, her face made beautiful by a mass of auburn hair, it was turned up as if the world at that moment was a wonderful and holy place. I waited. And when the short program was over, I wanted to go and congratulate the head nurse for such a wonderful production. 
And as I was just sitting there quietly alone with my thoughts, a middle-aged woman who I did not know came down the aisle towards me and she reached out her hands as she came close and she said, Oh, you saw her. You must have recognised your baby. That was my daughter who played the harp. I saw you watching her. You remember the little girl who was born with only one good leg 17 years ago. We tried everything at first and nothing would work. But now she has a whole artificial leg on that side but you would never know it. She can walk, she can swim and she can almost dance. But best of all, through all those years when she couldn't do any of those things, she learned to use her hands so wonderfully. She's going to be one of the world's great harpists. She enters the university this year at 17 years of age. Today, she is my whole life. And now she is so happy. And as we were closely listening and talking, we looked up and here was her daughter. As we spoke, the young lady had quietly approached, her eyes glowing, and now she stood right beside me. This is your first doctor, my dear. Our doctor, her mother said. Her voice trembled. I could see her literally swept back, just as I was. Through all the years of heartache to the day when I told her what she had to face. He was the first one to tell me about you. He brought you to me. Impulsively, I reached out and took the young lady in my arms. And across her warm shoulder, I saw the creeping clock in that delivery room 17 years before. I lived again those awful moments when her life was there in my hand, when I had decided on deliberate death for her. I held her away for a moment and looked in her face. You will never know, my dear. You will never ever know, nor will anyone else in the world know, just what tonight has meant to me. Please, go back to your harp. Go back to your harp and play Silent Night, Holy Night, just for me one more time. You see, I have a load on my shoulders that no one has ever seen, a load that only you can take away. Her mother sat beside me, quietly just took my hand as her daughter played. Perhaps, just perhaps she knew what was in my mind. And as the last strains of silent night, holy night, faded away, I think I found the answer and the comfort and the forgiveness that I had waited for so long. What does forgiveness mean to you, my friend? Have you experienced real forgiveness? Have you heard those words from someone's lips in whatever way or form, I forgive you? If you have your Bible this morning, please turn to Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. It's a story I'm sure that you are very familiar with. A story that's 
made real by our Lord and Saviour. And you know, these days as I read God's word, and I think of, you know, it tells us that if all the things that Jesus did had been written down, the books of the world wouldn't contain them. So each one of these little stories becomes incredibly precious. They're recorded here for you and I for a reason and a purpose. And so this little story is one that's tucked in here, but I believe it is there for a very special reason. Luke 7 and verse 36, we take up the story. And we're given no lead-in to it as such, but we're just simply told here that one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. You know, in the culture and the setting of that time, to go to somebody's place for a meal was a real experience. It wasn't just rocking up to pie and peas and um, a quick drink and away we, away we go. It was an experience. In their home, in their relationship, you became part of the family when you went into their home. And you know, this story tells us so much about human nature. It tells us so much about this Pharisee whose name was Simon. Because, you know, it says that he invited Jesus to come. And, you know, before you get too far into the story, you realise that Simon was so full of himself that he really didn't have room for any other guests in the house. But he invited people along so that he would be made special. This story was intended to be all about Simon and not about his guest. Because just note, just a little bit, it says about Jesus, so he went to the Pharisee's house, that's fine, but then reclined at the table. All of what should have happened is missing. It's all missing and we'll come to that. He, he elaborates on all this in the story, but we need to notice because it's told there right at the very beginning. We'll come back to that. And then it says in verse 37 that a woman who had lived a sinful life in the town learned that Jesus, here's, here's the difference, my friend, she learned that Jesus was there at this house and so what did she do? She got the thing that was the most precious in her life and brought it to him. The most precious, costly thing that she had. And as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. For those of us who, you know, if I come to your place for a meal, there's probably a 95% chance that we'll sit on a, a chair with four legs and sit at a table that has four, six or eight legs and we'll sit up there like good children sitting up to the table and eat with a knife and fork in, in our two hands. But in this, in this culture and in this setting, when you went to somebody's place for food, there was, the food was here in the middle, and what you sat on was what we would describe today as a couch, that you would tend to lie on and with one arm, and then you'd eat the food with the other hand. And so you were sort of in a lying down position at the table. So bit like army style, all the heads in and all the feet uh, were out. And so this is Jesus, if you picture him, feet out down here. And so this woman comes behind his feet and this takes place. Verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, Notice what it says, and in your Bible, I hope it says the same thing there, that he said to himself. This is what he's thinking. 
And you know, every time I read this, it just reminds me that whatever I think, I may as well have it up on the, the data projector because God reads and sees every, every thought that we have. If you ever doubted it, this text brings it so much alive for you. Because he said to himself, if, notice this is re getting back to what we were saying a little bit earlier, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is. And then the last bit he gets out through his teeth that she's a sinner. Whew. The story gets just so intriguing as it goes on. Notice immediately the next part that comes in here is Jesus' reaction to this man's thoughts. And Jesus said, and you know, you just imagine, here they are, food's in the middle and, you know, everybody would be there, um, there eating at this stage and uh, this guy's just wondering if everybody's watching and ob observing and, and, uh, that, and he's just had this thought and Jesus says, Simon, I've got something to tell you. In other words, today we'd say, hey, did I tell you about this or let me tell you about this? Right in the middle of it, maybe Simon was directly opposite or beside him there. And he says, tell me, teacher. And just like Nathan told that story to David, Jesus uses a simple little parable to get his message across. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him two years' wages, another one owed him two months' wages, let's say, around about. Neither of them had money to pay him back. So what did he do? What does the story tell us? He cancelled the debt. Now if, by some super extraordinary event that a hurricane comes through this afternoon and um, extremely high winds and, and hail and everything else, I presume the bonfire tonight will be cancelled. What does that mean? Is it going to be on a bit later? Uh, it's cancelled. It's n not going to happen. When these debts were cancelled, the debt didn't exist anymore. And so he asked him the question, now which of them will what? Which of them will love him more? Notice the way that Jesus brings this into the story. Which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. And Jesus said, you have judged correctly. And he doesn't put it in there, but it's really, now let's apply this, Simon, to our setting that we have here. You have said in your mind, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him. This is what Jesus' parable is answering in this story. So he says, keep in mind, here he is, and we'll just say, for instance, that Simon is there, directly opposite him, it says, then he turned towards the woman. So in this position, he would need to turn around because that's where the woman was. But who was he talking to? Simon. I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. This is just almost an abomination what happened when Jesus arrived at this man's house. He was treated worse than a dog. All of the normal cultural things that you would do, none of those took place. You, sorry, do you see this woman? I came into your house, you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing 
my feet. In other words, the normal greeting, you didn't even extend that to me, Simon. But this woman, who you are ready and willing to put down, has done all and above what you didn't do. You did not get, oh, sorry, because you did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, what was his claim? If you were a prophet, you would know that this woman is a sinner. Notice now what he says. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins, Simon, have been forgiven because she what? She loved much. Notice what Jesus' question was. Now, which of them will love him more? But he, Simon, who has been forgiven little, loves little. The next verse, verse 48, is worth all the money in the prize because it says... Jesus said to her, now Jesus is directly speaking to her, your sins are forgiven. Oh, my friends, to hear those words. Almost the American debt is spent every year in just some countries of the world to try and keep people in a balanced way of life because they haven't experienced these four words that Jesus says. Your sins are forgiven. Imagine hearing that from the voice of God. I tell you what, I'd bounce out of bed that next morning, wouldn't you? if that was a 3 a.m. experience for you or a 4 a.m. experience, to know that the delete key had been hit, Ken, and the screen is clear. All the stuff is gone. Your sins are forgiven. And notice in verse 50, the last verse in the chapter, this is really what it is all about. Your faith has saved you, Jesus said to her. Go in peace. My brother and my sister, you will never have peace. We will never have peace in this life unless we know that our sins are forgiven. Only forgiveness, you see, brings peace. Just a little while after we became Adventists, we were out on the Western Darling Downs in Queensland and uh, went through <clears throat> a very dry time. And we, um, we were relying on tank water for our house. That was supplied, the washing, the bathing, the drinking, everything. And as the tank gradually got down into the last uh, few rings of it, uh, we used to move down into the creek and just keep that last lot for drinking water and we'd bring up water from the creek and we used to boil up our water outside for, for baths and carry it in, inside. And so um, we'd boil up the creek water, throw some alum on top that would settle the mud to the bottom and you'd scoop the cleaner water off the top for, for bathing. And then the creek went dry. And uh, at this stage, our tank was virtually dry as well. And so I mentioned to our newfound uh, church family we were, that uh, they were about 35, 40 minutes away, that uh, we were in a desperate situation for water. And uh, not only were we in a desperate situation for water, but uh, we were in a desperate situation financially because we'd put all our money into the, into the fuel and the seed, uh, etc., for, for planting. 
And so uh, Stan said, well, that's not a problem. He said, our tanks are getting quite low as well. And they had a bore on their property which uh, pumped up uh, into a dam and it was reasonable water. And so he said, come on over and grab the truck and uh, put the tank on the back and fill up our tanks and take yourself over a load and, and fill up yours. So uh, I went ahead and did that and I was do, did theirs first in the morning and then uh, brought a load over to uh, our place. It was a real simple procedure. You had a hose coming out the, out the back of uh, Briggs and Stratton little pump and you just throw that into the water. The other one up in the top of the tank, start it up, pump it up and when you got to the place just reverse it, hook onto the bottom and put the other one up into the, uh, into the tank. So when I arrived at our place, I was thinking, I'd been away all morning, I was thinking of all these jobs, little things that needed doing. So I st put it up in the tank, started it up, and raced away to do these jobs. And I knew by now how long it took so I could be back in time before it uh, pumped right out. Raced back, and as I came round the corner of the house to my absolute horror, you know what happens with a... Uh, a, one of these little soft drink cans. You know, when you finish drinking it, you just sort of get it in your hands, particularly these aluminium ones, and you go, <coughs> well, that's what this tank on the back of the truck looked like. Just like one of these tanks on the, uh, the Fonterra go around and pick up, it was a, a tank like that. And it was just, man, it looked bad. Here I was. I never literally had 25 cents to my name. These same people had gone guarantor for $10,000 for us at the bank and it wasn't because they had money, it just added to their already huge debt that they had but they were trying to give us a start off uh, in, to get us going. So here were people that I was already in debt to, had absolutely nothing and I just virtually destroyed their tank. Because what had happened in my haste to get away, there was one small thing that I had forgotten. You know, when you're sucking water out of something, you need to let some air come in. And I had forgotten just to jump up on top and undo the bung just to let some air come in. So uh, as I was going back, it was a terribly long drive. Uh, my mind was going at a 1,000 mile an hour as to you know, you talk about the prodigal son, Father, I have sinned and just make me as one of your hired servants. Uh, all sorts of things were going through my mind and none of it was making sense. Six months old as a Christian and wondering what on earth I'd got myself into. You know, as I drove in um, and it came past their, their house on their property and they had a big shed down the bottom and which I presume Stan uh, was working. And so I came in and uh, just drove around the side of it. I mean, you know, you can hide, you know, a soft drink can, you can crunch it up a bit more and stick it in your pocket, but you can't do that with a tank on the back of a truck. It just stood out. And to me at this stage, it looked about as big as a 747. And uh, came in there, and you know, Stan never let me say one word. He just... He saw it, obviously, and by the time I got out of the, the, uh, the cab and down on the ground, come around, he said, um, I'll just grab the bung out of the top. And he said, uh, you go down and get as much water in this as you possibly can. And I went down and uh, filled it up. And we had about three or four goes at that. And every time we, when I came back up, he drilled a hole in the top of the bung and and put a, a truck valve in there and uh, we just kept on cranking the compressor up. And you know that tank, and you, some of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about, when metal cracks in like that, it's bad news. And you know this thing came back out, the only way that you could see that the damage had been there to it when we finished was the crease in the paint. You could run your hand along the side of the tank like that. It was smooth. 
that's 30 years ago. And never once in that whole time, Stan and I are still the best of, best of friends today, never once in all that time has he ever brought up or even mentioned about that experience. Not even laughing or joking about it. And so as a brand new Christian, I learned very early in my experience what forgiveness was really all about. What it truly means to be forgiven. And that, my friends, is the only way that you can really have peace in this life. May God bless you.